Soy Rubén Vigil, jefe del área de comunicación y prensa de la Fundación Princesa de Asturias. Bienvenidos a la rueda de prensa que va a ofrecer a continuación Sara Gilbert, eh, Premio Princesa de Asturias de Investigación Científica y Técnica. Recuerden que estamos en una rueda de prensa telemática, con lo cual para formular sus preguntas tienen que levantar la mano físicamente, utilizar la aplicación digital o el chat que ofrece en la propia, la propia plataforma. Eh, a continuación les daremos paso y formularemos la, la pregunta. Vamos a comenzar directamente con, con las cuestiones que, que ustedes tengan. Y ya hemos recibido una, una pregunta de Olaya Pena, de Televisión del Principado de Asturias. ¿Cuándo cree que se comenzará a vacunar masivamente a los niños? ¿Cree que es necesario? This is a, not a simple answer to that question. Um, children, on the whole, get infected but have very mild disease. And so when we're thinking about vaccinating children, we're considering the effect on the whole population and the spread of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, as well as thinking about their own benefits. So we shouldn't um, forget that. But I think that, that now teenagers are being vaccinated quite widely. Uh, it remains to be seen whether there's any need to vaccinate younger children. But with other um, coronaviruses that infect children, uh, that infect all of us throughout our lives, it's normal to have um, an infection in childhood, which is not a severe illness and results in um, immunity, which will prevent severe illness from happening later on. And that's probably what we're going to end up seeing eventually with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Gracias. Tenemos dos preguntas de Sara Álvarez, de Europa Press. La primera de ellas dice, ¿qué opina de las reticencias de países como España a aplicar su vacuna a menores de 60 años? Well, I'm not sure what the current situation is in Spain, I'm, or if you're referring to the very early days. Um, we now have excellent data on the use of vaccines, all of the vaccines that are licensed by the EMA in people, even over the age of 80. And it's been shown that they're all extremely effective, particularly at keep preventing hospitalization and preventing deaths. And so there are no doubts about the efficacy of any of the licensed vaccines in the older uh, part of the population. También de Sara Álvarez, ¿han hecho avances en la investigación para inocular la vacuna a menores de 12 años? There is a clinical trial running at the moment in um, children between the ages of 6 and 12 years. That clinical trial is happening in the UK. This is aimed at collecting data on the Um, reactions to the vaccine after the children have been vaccinated and also on the immune responses that are generated. That data will be made available to policy makers and uh, at the moment um, it's not clear what use will be made of that data. Jaime Martín de la Agencia EFE nos plantea varias cuestiones. Dice, siguen apareciendo nuevas cepas del coronavirus. ¿Las mutaciones harán que el virus sea cada vez más virulento? ¿Habrá que variar la composición de las vacunas para hacer frente a la pandemia en los próximos meses? What we're seeing is that the variants that have ended up causing most infections recently are the ones that are very highly transmissible, so the Delta variant, and there may now be another one that is in some cases is being called Delta Plus, which is potentially even slightly more transmissible than Delta. The um, original vaccines induce antibodies which cross-react with all of the variants, and a strong immune response from the original vaccines will work across all of the different variants. So it's not going to be a, a helpful situation to be in if we have to keep thinking about switching the vaccine all the time. And we don't need to do that with the, vac with the variants that are circulating at the moment. Of course, we have been generating some data on um, how to generate new versions of the vaccine in case they would be needed, but at the moment there is no plan to, to switch to any of the variant vaccines. También de Jaime Martín, de la agencia EFE, eh, nos pregunta, ¿se está iniciando la inoculación de terceras dosis a algunos sectores de población? ¿Cree que debe extenderse a toda la población? 
y no solo a determinadas edades? Well, we should be following the data to decide if and when a third dose of the vaccine is necessary. And so far, the data seems to indicate that in people under the age of 50, it probably isn't. Although that may be partly because in most countries, and certainly in the UK, people in the younger age groups received their first and their second vaccination much more recently. And we need to wait six months before giving a third dose. So at the moment, recommendations are only to give a third dose to older people who are more vulnerable and more in need of protection. And the situation needs to be kept under review. Uh, but we do need to wait six months between the second dose and the third dose to get the most effect of that booster dose to whoever it's given to. Elena Fernández Pello de la Nueva España nos pregunta: ¿Están trabajando ya en una segunda generación de vacunas contra el COVID? ¿Qué aspectos son mejorables? Well, it's difficult to um, know precisely what we would improve. There are some things that uh, theoretically, I think, might be an improvement, but they're not things that can be implemented very quickly, and they're not things that I'm working on myself very directly. So sometimes for respiratory viruses that infect through the nose and the mouth, the upper respiratory tract, it may be more effective to give the vaccine by an intranasal spray or by an aerosol going into the lungs. This is something that's being looked at in a very small way at the moment. And of course, for flu, there is a live uh, attenuated intranasal spray vaccine that's often given to children. So this may be something that we see more of in the future. I don't think it's something that's going to change very quickly. The other thing that we would like to be able to improve is the thermostability of the vaccines. So at the moment, some of the vaccines have to be stored frozen, and some of them need refrigeration. But it would be even better if they could be stored at ambient temperatures without any need for refrigeration at all. And there are some formulations that potentially would allow that to happen, at least for the adenoviral vector vaccines. Again, a lot more research will be needed before that's something that can be used on a wide scale. But I think it would be something that could improve um, supply of the vaccine and reducing the wastage of vaccines in the future. Gracias de nuevo. La agencia EFE le plantea otra cuestión. ¿Se puede acabar con la pandemia o habrá que convivir con ella y, por lo tanto, con las vacunas, como pasa con la gripe? So what we say is that what the pandemic will eventually, the pandemic virus will become an endemic virus. It will become a virus that we live with and that doesn't really cause us a great deal of difficulty anymore. And remember that there are four other coronaviruses that already infect people regularly and we don't have to monitor them because they don't cause severe disease in the vast majority of the population. Eventually, I expect that SARS-CoV-2 will move into that category, but um, it's not clear exactly how long it's going to take us to get to that point. Tenemos otra pregunta de la televisión del Principado de Asturias. Dice, quería saber su opinión sobre la importancia de extender las vacunas a toda la población mundial. ¿Es importante generalizar la inoculación en los países en vías de desarrollo desde un punto de vista ya no ético, sino de lucha contra el virus? It's really important to make the vaccine available all around the world for, for both of those reasons. Firstly, everybody should have access to these life-saving vaccines wherever they live. But secondly, if that doesn't happen and we allow the virus to continue to spread between people, every time that happens, the virus has an opportunity to uh, mutate and for an even more transmissible variant to be selected or possibly a variant that is not so well controlled by the vaccines that we currently have. And clearly, we don't want that to happen. So it's very important that we do more to get vaccines to the countries that so far have had very few doses. Tenemos otra pregunta de la agencia F. Dice, usted ha trabajado en el desarrollo de vacunas contra la gripe y también contra la COVID. ¿Hay grandes diferencias entre ambas? ¿Por qué despierta más recelo la del coronavirus? Bueno, 
Well, there are, diff there are different technical challenges in developing vaccines against flu and COVID. For flu, um, I've been thinking about avian flu or potentially pandemic flu, not just the seasonal flu viruses. And there are many different subtypes of flu that could potentially infect people and cause a pandemic, and they're all different. We don't see that level of diversity with COVID. We've seen some variants arising, but the variants are not really very different from the original virus. So in, in a sense, that's easier, but it's spread around the world very much faster. And obviously, because we have no prior immunity in the population has caused a lot of deaths. So we've had to, uh, many vaccine developers work really hard to produce vaccines very quickly so that we can get them out to the population and, and start saving lives with these vaccines, which is something that was routine for flu. Uh, but because we've all been exposed to flu many times through our lives, it tends to be only the older people that have the more serious infections. Um, in terms of technical challenges uh, and why, why the vaccine is being rejected, um, I think some people are concerned that we're using new technologies now. The reason we're using new technologies is because that's the only way we can go really quickly. If we have discovered a new virus and we want to make a vaccine in under a year, which several developers did do very successfully, it's necessary to use what we call a platform technology. And these are ways of making vaccines that can be used to make vaccines against lots of different viruses and other pathogens. And we do all of the work in advance. So we spend a lot of time doing development work on the adenovirus or the RNA platform before we start to do the last piece of the work on the specific vaccine against a specific virus. That's the reason we can go quickly. I don't think that's fully understood yet. Um, it's much faster if we don't have to start with the virus itself and manipulate it until it can be safely used as a vaccine. And um, in the future, I expect we'll see these platform technologies used in many different applications in the treatment of cancer, as well as in the treatment of, um, oh, sorry, in the prevention of infectious diseases. Tenemos otra pregunta de la agencia F. Dice, Derrick Rossi, otro de los galardonados, decía ayer en esa misma silla que las vacunas son muy baratas, pero hay cientos de millones de personas que siguen sin poder acceder a ellas mientras los laboratorios están obteniendo beneficios multimillonarios y crecientes. ¿Cree que es eso justo? Bueno, creo que la principal barrera the whole world be able to access the vaccines is actually the number of vaccines that are available in the world. And that we had to start from nothing. Vaccine manufacturing had to um, expand very rapidly. That has happened. And now there are more doses of the COVID vaccines made every month than there were the previous month. It's estimated that 11 and a half billion doses of vaccines will be made by the end of this year. But that still isn't enough. And we still need more doses so that we can get everybody vaccinated. And we need to look to the future and think about why we didn't have the manufacturing capability to make enough doses of vaccines to get to everybody. And one of the reasons for that is the, um, the lack of vaccine manufacturing facilities in some parts of the world, uh, in particularly in Africa. And what I'm interested in, in doing over the next few years is supporting initiatives to try to set up vaccine manufacturing facilities in several regional hubs in Africa, so that if we have to respond to a situation like this in the future, there will be facilities ready to receive the technology and start making the vaccines for local supply as quickly as possible, so that we shouldn't be in this situation again. Sí, tenemos otra pregunta. Se ha publicado que sus hijos participaron en los ensayos de las vacunas. ¿Qué les diría a aquellas personas que deciden no vacunarse? I think to people who are concerned about being vaccinated, I think you need to get information. You need to understand what the vaccine is, how it works, and what the risks and benefits are of being vaccinated. It's very, very clear that for adults, the, um, the benefits greatly outweigh the risks. Uh, slightly less so for children, but still, in most cases, the benefits do outweigh the risks because it protects the children's ability to, to go to school, among other things, and that's really very important. So don't reject something uh, and dismiss it because you simply don't understand it. If you don't understand it, take the time to find the information. 
Um, in Oxford, we have a website called the Vaccine Knowledge Project. It has lots of information which is available for people to read. There are other um, places you can find this information. You can ask your healthcare provider to tell you about how the vaccines work. And I think it's very important not to um, close your mind to using these vaccines because we, we really need them. Tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más. No sé si alguien quiere formular una nueva cuestión. Si no, damos por finalizada esta rueda de prensa. La siguiente, tenemos una más. A ver. Bueno, esta no sé, se la voy a plantear. Eh, Son muchas las personas que tienen una muñeca con su imagen. ¿Sabe cuántas muñecas Barbie de usted se han vendido? Uh, yes, precisely zero. Uh, they only make one, uh, and um, uh, uh, that's in my possession. So the, the doll is not for sale. Sorry. Muchas gracias. <laughs>